All right, Revelation 16, the gathering at uh, Armageddon. Well, let's pray, and then I'll try to introduce where we're going with this. Lord, we, uh, we do thank you for uh, the opportunity to spend time in your word, to have worshiped you, Lord, to uh, sing songs that describe what's in our hearts and minds that sometimes we find difficulty uh, expressing to you, uh, our love, our appreciation for your grace and your mercy. And I pray that our study this morning would uh, cause those things to resonate in our hearts, Lord, when we continue to look at what will happen during the second half of the tribulation, your wrath being poured out on a, on a world that's, that's just gone crazy in terms of living under uh, the rule of the Antichrist and those that have taken the, the mark of the beast and worship his image and what it, what it will mean in terms of uh, evil in this, in this world. Lord, to take the church and the, the presence of, uh, of Christ in the church out of this world and what a horrific place this will be then, Lord. So I pray that, uh, again, we grow in, uh, in an understanding of grace, what it is that you've done for us uh, through this study. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in chapter 16, uh, again, we do move into, finally, those bold judgments. So remember, uh, this all begins in terms of God's judgments with the seal judgments. And the seventh seal, when it opens, begins the trumpet judgments. When the seventh trumpet is blown, uh, then we kind of hit a pause, and we've been waiting for this to come. Looked at those events that, that culminated in the middle of the tribulation, that happened in the middle of the tribulation, that began and continue from the middle to the end. Uh, in those, uh, in those chapters uh, just preceding uh, chapter 16, chapter 15 was kind of then the uh, kind of an overview of things that would be happening at the end. And now we finally get to chapter 16. Now, uh, what I've decided to do is basically take us through the whole chapter in one, in one shot. Uh, we could have broken it up. I, I just didn't want to spend another, another whole week on the wrath of God for some reason. <laughs> And, uh, and carefully explaining, you know, the, how horrific all these things are, are, are going to be, and, the, and they are. So uh, if you've looked ahead or grabbed the notes, you realize that uh, you may be uh, a little bit concerned at this point when you realize this is a seven-point message, and I have trouble getting through three sometimes, but don't panic. Uh, I'm going to kind of move through very quickly to get us to the sixth bold judgment, which is, uh, again, the preparation for what is sometimes... Um, probably wrongly put, the Battle of Armageddon. There's not a Battle of Armageddon, but there is a campaign. There are several events that take place surrounding this idea of Armageddon, and it's introduced in the Six Bold Judgment, so I'm going to try to move quickly to get there so we can spend a little more time uh, on that. But just uh, a couple of things uh, in terms of introduction. Uh, the idea is that there's a place in Israel, it's the Valley of Jezreel, and uh, I've got a slide here for you. It's uh, incredibly beautiful. That's only a portion of it, but you can see it's uh, uh, very productive in terms of agriculture, uh, beautiful flatlands. Uh, those hills to the left that you can barely see would continue up, and if you went up and over and down, you'd come into Nazareth. If you went up and over a little bit more, you'd come into the, the area of the Sea of Galilee. If you kept going to the left this way, you'd hit the Mediterranean, and to your right, off in the mist, would be the, uh, the Jordan River. We're up in the, the northern part of the country, a huge uh, valley, the Valley of Jezreel. Uh, it one, there's one city noted there, the city of Megiddo. Now, we get Armageddon from the Hebrew word har, which is mountain or hill, so the mountain of Megiddo. Uh, and that phrase is introduced here in this chapter uh, as the place where the nations of the world, a multinational force, will gather in that land to come against the remaining Jews that are, that are in Israel. So therefore, we get the idea of Armageddon or Harmageddon. Uh, again, keep in mind, it's, it's a gathering place uh, where these armies are going to come. You might liken it to during World War II at the end, Great Britain became a gathering place for multinational forces to launch out against Germany and Nazi, Nazism on what we call D-Day. We didn't really fight in England, but that's where we gathered. That's what this place is going to be in terms of this, uh, the campaigns of, of Armageddon. Now, the reason that these multinational forces are going to get there, and we're going to talk about their, their route and who they're, they're made of and so forth, is to finally uh, come against 
uh, the Jewish people that remain. Now, there's, we'd say there's four different groups of Jewish people during this last time period. Uh, there are the 144,000 that have been sealed and protected by God uh, that are referred to as the first fruits of a worldwide harvest in terms of uh, as a worldwide revival around the world. People, men and women of children, during this time, however horrific it is, are still coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The 144,000, my opinion, are out there preaching the gospel. That's how one of the ways they hear the gospel. Uh, that's one group, and they are protected and sealed by God. You have other Jewish people that are hearing the gospel, uh, receiving the, the, the message, placing their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and they're martyred for their faith, as would be Gentiles. But that's another group of, of Jewish uh, people. You have a third group that are there referred to as the remnant, and we've spent some time talking about them, in the middle of the tribulation, when the Antichrist, this world leader, sets up an image of himself uh, in the newly rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, in the holy place, uh, and, and energized by Satan, it's able to, in a sense, come alive. And everyone at that point has to worship the beast. Uh, at that point, uh, the, this Jewish remnant, which will be about a third of the population of Jews on planet Earth at that point in time, will flee, understanding the words of Daniel and, and the words of Jesus. They will flee out into the Judean wilderness, and uh, we believe they will basically be uh, hid and protected supernaturally by God in the area of present-day Petra uh, in, the, in the, the nation of Jordan, uh, Basra in the, in the Hebrew. That's the third group. The fourth group of, of Jewish people are in Israel. Uh, and uh, it was only very recently that there were more Jews living in Israel than, than any other place in, in the world. But uh, most of them will be living there at that time. It's the Antichrist's desire to kill every one of them, and he will be able to eventually, we're told in the scripture, kill two-thirds of them on the, on the face of the planet. Again, uh, uh, Hitler and Nazism killed a third of the Jews in the Holocaust, so this will, be, this will be much, much worse. The nations of the earth are gathered, the kings of the earth under the Antichrist, gathered at Armageddon, for this last assault upon the Jewish people. Now, we don't really see it battling because they don't do a lot of battling because Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth and prevents that and uh, to some degree and uh, wipes out uh, that army. But that's chapter 16 where we're going to this idea of introduced of Armageddon and the stages that, uh, that, set the, uh, that come into play for that. Let's take a look at the, uh, as, again, we want to kind of move through these opening verses about the bold judgments. And the first one, the bowl uh, of God's wrath is poured out in verses 1 to 4. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sword came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. So first we notice a couple things. that there's a, It's an imperative, it's a command to pour out God's wrath. It's from a, a loud voice. There's about 20 times that we have that, I, that description of a loud voice here in the book. Uh, it's, again, it's a singular voice. It originates from, from the temple. And we saw last week that the temple of God at this point in heaven is filled with smoke or God's Shekinah glory, his visible presence. And it's these uh, seven angels who's already received the bowls of God's wrath that are now commanded to pour them out. Uh, and uh, we note that when that happens, uh, there's a distortion of physical appearance. In other words, uh, these guys end up having a foul and loathsome sore that comes upon men. Uh, I find that interesting just given the fact that uh, we now, at least in, in the West and a lot of other places as well, seem to be really have this tremendous fixation upon physical appearance and looking younger and looking a certain way and so forth. And this thing will absolutely distort the physical appearance of man. It's going to be painful uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, and we'll note that it comes upon all of those that have taken the, the, the mark of the beast. Uh, the second bowl is poured out into the sea, which turns the sea to, to blood. Now, again, similar language under the second trumpet judgment. 
but uh, nothing that severe. I mean, it's severe. It's the sea. Uh, we kind of made a case for it. It was talking about the, the Mediterranean. Uh, a third of what's there is, uh, is destroyed and so forth. But now this is not the same thing. Uh, it's much later. That's a trumpet judgment. This is a bold judgment. And so every creature in the sea will be killed. And uh, no more sashimi, no more sashimi. No more OPE, no more OPE. Everything is absolute. See, that's why it's good we're in heaven already. Uh, all of that. We just had a, 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 you know, a uh, whale carcass you know, wash up at uh, Punalu. And uh, uh, people were very concerned. Could you smell that from your house? No, okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they're pretty close up there. But uh, you can imagine every, every, every creature in the sea is dead. Uh, the stench that will be uh, around the earth, but uh, as well as the tremendous uh, loss of, uh, of food. And, and again, it's not, the sea is not merely a different color. Uh, it's the idea of the, the death that's in it. Uh, the sea turns to blood. The third bowl is poured out into the water, fresh water supply of the earth. And again, similar to the third trumpet judgment in Revelation 8, where a third of the springs and rivers were affected, but now this is all of them. Uh, I read one commentary that said that uh, uh, the only drinking water would be whatever was in a cistern or whatever had been stored up to that point. Uh, it may not include something coming right out of a rock in terms of a spring. There could be a little bit of drinking water left, but you can imagine when, when all the rivers and all the springs and basically the water supply of the earth, you've only got days, right, before people are just dying, uh, you know, in tremendous numbers uh, uh, around, around the earth. So those are the, uh, uh, the first three bold judgments. Let's take a look at the fact that in verses 5 to 7, we have the righteousness of God's judgments uh, proclaimed. Verse 5 says, And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another angel from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So two angels proclaim God's righteousness. One is identified as an angel of the waters. The other one is calling out from the altar. And their concern certainly seems to be the fact that everything that is being done is right and it's just in what God is, is doing. And... One of the things that we'll see as we go further and these judgments continue is that nobody's repenting over this. In fact, they are cursing God and they are blaspheming God and they're recognizing, in other words, they're showing what's really in their hearts. Uh, and from heaven's perspective, and, and we'll be with them. And again, we've tried to, you know, we just have a hard time with this because of the tremendous amount of death and destruction uh, it's hard for us to imagine that in heaven we're going to be rejoicing over this, but uh, keep in mind the fact that uh, uh, the, the bully on the playground is getting his just due. Uh, the person who is that evil person that has brought terrible things on this planet is finally going to be uh, dealt with, and, uh, and that's, the, uh, that's the idea. They're just All of the injustices of this life will finally be, you know, Somebody will step in and, uh, and, and do something. I'll tell you a little story. Didn't have my notes. <laughs> Relates here a little bit. Jim Samer, he's the system manager at the Safeway store right here. Jim and I used to work together in Channel Lakes a number of years ago before the uh, Safeway Hamakua store opened over there. So that was really the, the bigger uh, store at, at that time. And uh, we were work and uh, I was just glad that I wasn't there the night that this happened, but uh, I used to have to help run the liquor department up front there and stuff. Although one of the things you're trying to do is not have things stolen. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so, and so you kind of have to do things to try to prevent that. And some, some guys were a little more subtle than others. And um, there were uh, one night that I wasn't there. The other person in play was when we were at the YMCA, the guy that ran the YMCA, Bill Stonebreaker. He was the other guy working, <laughs> working that night with Jim. And uh, I don't know if we're going to keep moving to facilities where uh, I have friends that worked at Safeway with or not. But uh, uh, anyway, Jim's in there. Guys, two, two large men of Polynesian ancestry come in. 
and they, they go up and they rip off all the cavassier, all the expensive liqueurs and stuff. They, they, they sell it to the Korean bars. That's how they, uh, people earn a living doing this. And, uh, and then they rip off the meat counter because that goes to the Korean bars too. They pay cash and they try to rip off cigarettes. So anyway, people actually do this for a living. And um, uh, anyway, these, apparently these guys did this. So, and they just came in and just took it. Boom, boom, boom. Just gathered it in their arms, right? They're just going to walk out with it like I dare you you know, to stop me, and Jim, trying to do his duty the best he could, runs out the, the, the exit door after them, and uh, uh, just, you know, try to get them to stop and everything, and all of a sudden, uh, he comes flying back in through the exit, the guy just puts his bottles down, and boom, just nails him, and, and physically, it's not like in the movies, when people get hit for real, you know, only takes like one good punch, and you're out, uh, so he's, he's, he's down on the ground, Face is bleeding, uh, and the guy comes back in the door, right, and then picks him up and begins to pelt him again, gives him a couple other good shots right to the face. Then Bill Stone, not Stonebreaker, Bill Stone, uh, our friend from the YMCA, who at that night happened to be the biggest guy that was there. We were a little younger in those days. We were in our 20s. He was the biggest guy there. And, uh, and so he runs up, and he's not going to try to take this guy on that's like a foot taller than he is, but just to tell him that the police are on the way and you should leave, and he's trying to get in between him and, and Jim. And this guy picks him up. He probably weighs about 220, right? He's no little guy. The guy picks him up and throws him on top of the 25-pound bags of rice that are up against the window. Well, that was the best shot anybody had, you know, so... You know, there's just times like that, it's just like, where is justice? You know, where is there somebody that could step in and end this brutality? Uh, I think Jim got punched another time before the guy left. And of course, in the end, by the time the police arrive, all of the cavassier and liquor is long gone. And it's like, we don't know what they're talking about. And it's just his word against his word. And those guys walk. Nothing happens to them. And do we think, how can that be? And that's just a personal experience. We've all got our stories plus what's in the news every night. But the point is, is that we're in heaven. And this is the great and mighty day of God when this happens. And even though it's horrific in terms of numbers, actually we're all going, finally, finally something is being done in terms of what's going on here on planet Earth at this time. And... um, Hope that doesn't run me over my time here. But uh, let's go on to the third thing. There's an acknowledgement that the plagues are from God, verses 8 to 11. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over uh, these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on Uh, on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of their pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. So the fourth bowl is a plague that involves the the sun. Again, uh, in the trumpet judgments, Revelation 8, the sun, the moon, and the stars are struck, reducing their, uh, their light by a third, but this is very different. The opposite is true. Uh, uh, something happens uh, in terms of the uh, uh, geophysical world that allows the sun to beat down and now create these, uh, these pains and, uh, and sores upon people. Uh, and, uh, you know, people are concerned about the global warming, and, uh, and that's probably a good idea, but, it, but uh, uh, there won't be a whole lot we can do about it. This is the ultimate global warming, and, uh, and it's going to cause... Uh, terrible things that happen to people. The fourth plague involves a son. Uh, those affected by the plague refer to it as a judgment from God. So uh, again, the text implies it's specifically against those who have taken the mark of the beast and, and worshipped his, uh, his image. The text says it was uh, power was given to him, referring not to the son, nor to an, uh, uh, excuse me, referring to the son, not to an angel or to God. So the son has this tremendous power to uh, impact people's lives. But notice those affected by the plague acknowledge its source. They blaspheme the name of God who has power over the, the plague. So uh, they did not repent nor give him glory. And I always found this uh, to be very, very interesting that even at that point, uh, uh, at that point, there's no atheist. <laughs> 
at that point. There's no, the theory of evolution goes out the window. Apparently, everybody recognized that there is a God, that there's a God of heaven, that they are experiencing his wrath and his judgment against them, but nobody repents. Nobody repents. In fact, their response is very differently. They blaspheme God uh, as a result because of what is, uh, what is happening to them. And I, I did hear a testimony of a, of a guy that survived a, a plane crash. Uh, and the way he survived, it was as it, as it hit the ground, there was a, an opening in the roof that he was able to climb out and pull a couple of other people out before the whole thing uh, went up into flames. But the thing that struck me about his uh, testimony in which he was saying God had you know, supernaturally helped him and it was a miracle that he survived and so forth, that as the plane was going down and everybody on board knew that they were going to crash, the end was near, he thought as a Christian, I mean, he was praying like crazy. He just assumed everybody would be praying, everybody would be crying out to God. I'd say that's a pretty good time to get right with God right there before the plane hits the ground. He says that was not the case. People up and down the aisles were cursing God, that God had allowed that to happen to them right before they, uh, they hit the ground. It's, it's just interesting. You don't know what's in the, uh, the heart of man. But, uh, but here it, it all comes out, even under these circumstances. They're, uh, again, still in a willful rebellion against God. The fifth bowl, again, is a plague that involves the beast. Verse 10 tells us the kingdom of the beast came, became full of darkness. And apparently the, the darkness uh, intensified the pain from the, the sores and the other things that they were going through. Uh, people were in such anguish that they were gnawing at their, at their tongues uh, there's a, actually a similar expression that Jesus uses in Matthew 25 when he talks about people being cast into hell or outer darkness where there will be, uh, again, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know if that's exactly the same thing, but evidently what people are getting is a preview of hell here on earth. When you think about uh, uh, everything being cast into darkness, the suffering that's, uh, that is going on, seemingly to be no hope or, or no way out, it will be a, a tremendously desperate, uh, a desperate time. Uh, what does the preview of hell on earth do for people? One, those afflicted by them continue to blaspheme God because of their pains and their sores. Uh, and again, the sores refer back to the first plague and uh, confirm that uh, it's those that have taken the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. Uh, the second thing we've mentioned, they refused to, re uh, to repent. They did not repent of their deeds, verse 11. And again, it's a, it's a graphic reminder that, uh, that we should all be thankful of. If we've come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, we'll be saved from all of this. We will not have to go through all of this. And it's because he reached out to us he revealed himself to us. He sent his spirit into this world and, and, and came after us and drew us to himself. And we could be so thankful and should be so thankful for that. The third thing about the darkness that uh, should be noted uh, is that it uh, seemingly does not affect the Transjordan uh, area because we're about ready to get to the sixth bowl judgment where this whole campaign of Armageddon begins. And remember that uh, Israel, in terms of the land that God gave uh, to Abraham, extended from the, the river of Egypt, presumably the Nile, although there's another large river there, and it goes all the way to the Euphrates. That is Erat Israel. That's the land of Israel that God gave to Abraham. Of course, the people of Jordan and Iraq would probably have a different view of that. Uh, but that's, uh, as far as God's concerned, that's, that's the land of Israel. Uh, and uh, it seems, because of the staging of the battles of what is about to happen, this outer darkness, this darkness that comes on the planet, somehow is not affected in this area of, uh, of Israel or the Transjordan area. The fourth thing about the, the bull judgments is they prepare the way for Armageddon, and that's in uh, verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bull on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So the river Euphrates must be prepared. Uh, and uh, again, just uh, very interesting. John uses uh, uh, some, uh, some things in the Greek syntax where he tries to emphasize something here. And literally he says, uh, it's the river, the great. And when he uses two uh, articles, definite articles uh, like that, uh, it's, for, it's for emphasis. And the emphasis is, this is the borderline of Israel. Uh, this is the emphasis of the fact that when this dries up, 
everything sets in motion like, like dominoes to Jesus Christ coming back to planet Earth uh, in a time of, uh, of great celebration as, a time, as well as a time of great judgment. Uh, and the church, we find that we are coming with him during that time. But it all begins by the river Euphrates being, uh, being dried up. So it's, uh, it's very significant. And I think it's probably meant to re remind us of the fact that all of that area is the land of Israel. Of course, that's a, a big issue today with uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell that's there negotiating in Israel today on behalf of the uh, Obama um, uh, administration trying to get Israel to give up even more land than they've already given up. And they've done that many times. And so far, every time they gave up land to the uh, so-called Palestinians, what happened is it became a hotbed for terrorism and a place from which they could launch for, for their attacks. So far, every time they've given up land to them, all they've got is attacked more and more. It's never, never brought any, any peace at all. Uh, and, um, and I think here's an emphasis of the fact that uh, all of that will be made right in the end. The text speaks of kings, implying several nations are going to be involved uh, and since all nations are gathered against Jerusalem at Armageddon, uh, we would expect, uh, again, uh, the major players in the Middle East to be uh, in, uh, involved. Now, um, some Bible teachers, some books on prophecy and end times uh, take this passage and they take Revelation 9 because it talks about the rivers Euphrates and they kind of merge these and come up with some very interesting ideas. Uh, they, because basically there, the river Euphrates is mentioned uh, with a two million man army from it. Here you've got the kings of the east coming across the river Euphrates after it's dried up. Uh, so who are the kings of the east? Well, they would say, who could bring about a two million man army? Only China, therefore the kings of the east is, is China moving across. Now there's a couple of real uh, inherent problems with that is that those two passages have nothing to do with each other. Chapter 9 is in the first half of the tribulation, and it clearly says it's a demonic army that goes out. They're not Chinese. It's a demonic army that has nothing to do with this passage. So who are the kings of the east? Well, we can look at that, but one thing's for sure, we don't know what the number of the army will be other than it's a multinational force. Well, it just so happens that east of the Euphrates River is this little country there called Iran. And for some reason, they seem to hate Israel. And they seem to make threats against Israel and their destruction on a regular basis. Again, they will be one of the kings of the east. Certainly, uh, the other Muslim uh, republics in southern Russia that also hate Israel uh, would think would have no problem having given the order uh, to, to march against Israel to destroy Jews. Uh, and, uh, and it could include uh, the Chinese. Who knows? But kings of the east, multinational forces... Uh, the ones that are there are able to march across because of the river Euphrates uh, being dried up. Now, rabbis and teachers of the Old Testament have been talking about this for a very long time. Zechariah and some of the other prophets spoke about all the nations of the earth coming against Israel, uh, and this is the time that they come. I just want to read a couple of those passages to you uh, and then read a couple of passages about God's response to it. Zechariah 12, 3 says, And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. So all nations of the earth are gathered against Israel at a time when Israel has become like a heavy stone. And there's a lot of people in the, in the world today that see Israel as a very heavy stone. After all, the reason we're having to fight these jihadists all around the world today is because of Israel. If Israel would just give up more land, if Israel would just get along, if Israel would just do this, then the rest of us in the world wouldn't be having the kind of problems that we're having, having now, many voices in the world would, uh, would say. But uh, again, Israel's become that uh, cup of trembling or, or a heavy stone even in the days that uh, we live in. Zechariah goes on in that uh, chapter in verse 8 says, "...in that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem." The one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So 
God, they're saying there's going to be a time in the future when all the nations come against Jerusalem. And when they do, the weakest, the feeble person, I will raise him up and make him a warrior like, like David and so forth in that uh, comparison. Chapter 14, Zechariah goes on and says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half of it towards the south. So one of the culminating things about, again, we're not saying battle, but a campaign of Armageddon, one of the last things that happens is Jesus Christ, after his return and dealt with the armies there on the plains of, uh, of Megiddo, or Megiddo, and he's gone down and rescued the Jim, Jewish remnant there in uh, modern-day Petra, uh, and makes his way, Isaiah 63 says, back to Jerusalem when it's finally all done and said, he steps on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city and, uh, and it splits in two. But again, the, uh, the Old Testament prophet said over and over again, there would come a day when all the nations of the earth come against Jerusalem uh, and the Jewish people. And that's what, uh, what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. It's also to be noted that... Um, uh, ancient kings, when they conquered Jerusalem, and it's been conquered and reconquered many times, that is their normal thing. They would go to the highest point, the Mount of Olives, and they would stand up there, lift up their sword, and make a proclamation that they were victorious and, and so forth. Uh, and it seems that, uh, that Jesus Christ will, will do the same. So again, uh, the kings of the earth are uh, a multinational force. Uh, there will be nations from around the world involved, apparently, uh, but in terms of those coming across the Euphrates, those east of the Euphrates, we certainly would expect to see the Muslim nations that are part of the former Soviet Republic as well as uh, uh, Iran in, involved in, uh, in all of this. And, uh, and what triggers it all is, is the Euphrates rivers uh, begins to, to dry. Now, we've talk, I've talked to uh, a couple of um, uh, guys from the church, other Marines that have been uh, visiting that part of the world recently in the last couple of years. And while they're there, the ones that are familiar with this passage of Scripture have all uh, noted the fact that the Euphrates River is drying up. It's getting lower and lower, I mean, dramatically lower. Some of the guys just in the year that uh, they were going, and they're like, is this it? <laughs> is this part of the whole thing? Well, uh, people upstream are diverting the water. And, uh, and maybe that's how God will do it in this day. But Isaiah the prophet reminds us that the Lord doesn't really uh, need any help. He's kind of in the business of drying up rivers. He's done it a few other times uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Jewish people. Uh, uh, Isaiah eleven fifteen. Isaiah says, The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind, he will shake his fist over the river. So remember that time, Moses and the Red Sea? God didn't have any trouble parting and drying up a river or a sea for them to get across. Isaiah goes on and says, With his mighty wind he shall shake his fist over the river. And there's a definite article there in the Hebrew, the river, referring to the Euphrates, and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. There shall be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left uh, from Assyria as it was for Israel, and that day he came up from the land of Egypt. So Isaiah reminds us that when it's time to dry up the river, God, God will be able to dry up the river Euphrates. Zechariah and Zechariah 10 also mentions the river Euphrates being dried up. He shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up. Then the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall Depart. So what prepares the way for Armageddon is the, is the Euphrates River being dried up. Uh, fifth, the presence of demonic forces are seen in verses 13 to 16. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Notice it's like, it's a simile. They're not frogs. They're, they're somehow similar to frogs. Out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth, mouth of the false prophet... For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a, uh, as a thief. Blessed, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together 
to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. So the presence of the demonic forces are seen in, in the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So again, it's, it's really hard to know how this plays out. But uh, again, Satan, the Antichrist, this world leader, the, the world religious leader, all have some demon in them that comes out of them that is compared to a frog. They go out and they basically are instrumental in, uh, in, uh, in working to draw these nations uh, uh, against Israel. And uh, certainly we've kind of um, talked about this before and the importance of our own prayers for our nation or nat our national leaders and others because there are demonic forces out there seeking to influence national leaders to orchestrate things their way uh, and, uh, in opposition to uh, God's will for uh, people's lives. But here they go out and I don't really know how they're like a frog. I don't know if you like frogs, but uh, I, I don't know that they're, uh, they, uh, it's talking about their appearance or having an a, uh, ugly appearance. Uh, David Hawking offers the suggestion that, uh, uh, that it could be like frogs in the way that frogs leap and jump and uh, the staging of these multinational forces, once they start moving, uh, could advance very rapidly and very quickly, and, and, uh, uh, and this thing could all go down very, very fast. That, that could be the way that they are like frogs. We don't really uh, know. What we do know is that uh, they are spirits of demons. It says that very clearly, uh, and they are, they are capable of performing signs, and uh, we remember that the false prophet is able to perform great signs and, and wonders, uh, which uh, helps us remember that just because something is miraculous does not mean it's from God. And I can tell you, having come out of the New Age movement, I, I fell for that deception. I thought if something was miraculous, therefore it must be from God, and that's not true. Uh, Satan is able to counterfeit things, uh, and we need to certainly be careful at our own, uh, our own times that we live in but uh, these demons are out influencing national leaders, these other kings. Remember Daniel said that at one point in time when the Antichrist rises to power, he, he, he basically forces uh, some of them into submission, uh, and the others, seven kings, willingly bow to him. So there's at least seven world regions or powers where they've submitted to him, uh, and these demonic forces are out. Again, what triggers Armageddon, the end of the end? Well, it's the drying of the Euphrates River which sets the stage, but now it's these demonic entities that are bringing, in a sense, uh, foolishly, all of these multinational forces uh, into uh, Israel. The presence of the demonic forces are certainly seen in their, their purpose, as I just mentioned, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And once again, John uses a, a phrase with a definite article, the, the day, the great because this is all about God. This is what God is doing. This is what God is orchestrating. And what makes it a great day? Again, because we, uh, if you're like me, kind of struggle through some of this because of how horrific it's going to be. Uh, it'll be a great day because the evil of this world will be completely defeated. It will be a great day when anti-Semitism and the work of Satan and demons are destroyed and it will be a great day because God is the one who is in focus. We say battle sometimes. God is the only one doing any fighting here at all. And there is no question of the outcome. In fact, uh, and I mentioned this before, listen to a couple of scriptures that talk about, in a sense, God mocking at the idea that these armies could defeat him or go against him. Uh, the prophet Joel, chapter 3, verse 9 says, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up, the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around, cause your mighty ones, cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. <clears throat> God is uh, saying here, proclaim among the nations, your mighty men, hey, even the weak, hey, you guys should just kind of suck it up and say that you're strong. In fact, take some of your farming equipment and try to make weapons out of it. That's going to work really well. Uh, this is kind of a, a mockery at, at what, these, what these armies are attempting to do here at the end. Psalm 2 is, uh, is very much the same way. The writer there says, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot a vain thing? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. And the Lord against, uh, against the Lord and against his anointed one or Messiah saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. God sits in heaven watching this, uh, in a sense, mocking and laughing because the outcome is, is certain. And one of the things that we'll see as they are gathered there and as Christ returns to the planet in Revelation 19, they now turn, in a sense, their guns and everything they've got as though they could defeat uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And, uh, and the, but the outcome is certain. Uh, the sixth thing, there's a promise of Jesus that he's coming soon. And I don't know if you caught that, but it just seems like this out-of-place verse that just kind of like, okay, we're talking about Armageddon, and all of a sudden there's this Jesus thing, you know, right, right there. And it's, it's familiar language to us, Jesus talking about coming like a, a thief in the night uh, here right in, right in the middle of all this. Uh, later in chapter 22, Jesus says, uh, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Uh, 2 Peter 3.10 says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Jesus in Matthew 24, 42-44, talks about his coming uh, quickly like a thief. Paul says the same thing, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. 5, so in the middle of all of this, when the stage is being set for Armageddon, the campaign of Armageddon, suddenly there's a verse that's inserted that I would assume would be very meaningful to anybody that's undergoing persecution, anybody that's going under uh, a great difficulty, anybody that's living through these times, if they have this, this to read, a manuscript, a book, something they are able to hang on to in terms of the New Testament, the idea that when it's, everything seems like it's at his worst, Jesus is saying, hang in there because I am coming quickly. I think it's meant to be a, a blessing and, uh, and an encouragement. Uh, it's, uh, it makes up the third uh, beatitude that we have uh, in the book of Revelation. The first one is in verse 3, uh, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is near. It's a beatitude. It's a blessed are you if you, you read it out loud and you listen to it, uh, there's a blessing in it. Uh, in in uh, chapter 14, verse 13, the second beatitude, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. There's a blessing for those that have made it through this tribulation time, that have placed their faith in Christ and are able to rest from their labors. And then here's the third one uh, that we've mentioned, verse 15 of our chapter. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So uh, again, the only way that you can be prepared, because when Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth, Certainly when he comes for the church and when he comes again, uh, both of those things will happen very, very quickly. He's trying to encourage them, but I think there's certainly a, a message for us as, uh, as well. Uh, that uh, uh, the only way that we can prepare for Jesus Christ coming, the only way they can prepare uh, is to place their faith in him. To receive the robes of righteousness that he has for them, for us that we may not walk in a, in a shameful way. We'll come back to this here at the end of the message, but uh, I think it's, uh, again, important for us to be living as though Christ could and he could come quickly and come for the church at, uh, at any moment. The, the last thing here is the power of God is seen in these final judgments in verses 17 to 21. Uh, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, uh, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found and great hail from heaven fell upon men, east hellstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, 
since that plague was exceedingly great. So the power of God seen from a voice uh, from the throne, and we talked about this last week, the idea that uh, this is finally all coming down, it's finally happening, it's finally going to be completed. From the fall of mankind with Adam and Eve in the garden, the plan of redemption through all of those years, it's finally going to be completed. And we likened it to Jesus on the cross uh, last week when he said, tell, tell us die, uh, it is finished, it's complete. Uh, and now everything that's going to happen before Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth to establish his kingdom with these things, this wrath that's being poured out, the bold judgments, it is done. Secondly, the power of God is seen in a great earthquake. And notice that it will be the greatest earthquake that has ever been seen on the face of the planet. And you and I just very recently have witnessed the destruction that comes from an earthquake. I'm going to watch the uh, TV each night and the horrific scenes that we see uh, in Haiti, the, the suffering, people being, even yesterday, 11 days later, still being poured from the, uh, from the rubble. But just uh, every building leveled, uh, every, everything falling down, everything you own, you know, uh, you can imagine losing your home, your possession, your job. Several of your family members have been killed. I mean, what a horrific thing to have, uh, to have gone through. And and uh, we praise God for the, all of those that are taking part in the relief uh, efforts there uh, and continue to pray for the rebuilding of that country. But that is pale in comparison to what this earthquake will do. Uh, it's, uh, we, we have not known the magnitude. Uh, notice some of the things that happen as a result. Uh, there's destruction of the world's cities. In other words, the major capitals of the world, those buildings will absolutely be destroyed, you know. You think of Tokyo or Hong Kong or Shanghai or, you know, London, Paris, you know, New York, Waimanalo, you know, all the big capitals of the world, <laughs> if you're still with me here. But uh, the world capitals, that's what it's talking about. They will be left in, uh, in, in ruins. Sorry, I just see that bumper sticker all the time. It just kind of came to mind. Uh, the power of God is seen in the disappearance of, of mountains and islands. It means they're gone. Yeah, now, again, some of the islands are, are really dis, uh, are gone already in the first half of the tribulation. Uh, depending upon how you view that, that one passage that talks about the destruction in the sea as being local to the Mediterranean or if it's worldwide. So if the Hawaiian islands are not gone in the first half of the tribulation, they're certainly gone uh, at, uh, at this point. Uh, the uh, power of God is seen in the dropping of giant uh, hailstones. Uh, a talent uh, basically is about 100 pounds. So you've got hail fall, falling from the sky about the size of a car, small car. Uh, and, uh, and people are crying out as a result of it. Uh, and lastly, the power of God is seen in the consequences that God will bring on those who worship the beast uh, and his, his image. So the, uh, everything that was happening in the first half of the tribulation in terms of its judgments or is severely intensified uh, in this last three and a half year period. And we don't really know that, is this all come right at the end? Uh, are these judgments spread out? Uh, we don't really know that, but uh, when they come, it will be uh, uh, just a, a terrific, a horrific time here. And, uh, but once again, what's in the heart of man will be manifest. People will not be getting on their knees and crying out to God. In fact, they will be standing up and blaspheming God, blaspheming the name of God, everything that's in the heart of the man. Jesus says it's, it's from the heart that the mouth speaks. What's in their heart will be crying out. No wonder the angels are saying that you are righteous and true in your judgments and everyone is getting their just due. But uh, as we've mentioned on other occasions, of course, our just due is the same as theirs. But by God's grace... We are not receiving it, uh, and it's one of the reasons why we should certainly uh, worship God and thank God for his grace each and, and every day. Now, let's go back to this idea of Jesus coming like a thief. I, uh, uh, again, I think it's meant to be an encouragement for them at that time. I think it's probably a great blessing for anybody going through persecution today, uh, but I think it's meant to be uh, and can be seen as an exhortation for us as well. I wanted to read a, a close with a little article by Doug Mendenhall, who uh, I am not familiar with, but I just read this this week, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a euphemism. He's, 
he's kind of making up a little story as though Jesus just calls, you know, and he's going to be stopping by the house <laughs> any minute and, hey, honey, we better get ready. You know, Jesus is coming for dinner kind of a thing. But there's some things here that I think uh, maybe will we'll have a, a message for us. He writes, quote, Jesus called the other day to say he was passing through and wondered if he could spend a day or two with us. I said, sure, love to see you. When will you hit town? I mean, it's Jesus, you know. It's not every day you get a chance to visit with him. It's not like it's your in-laws and you have to stop and decide whether the advantages outweigh your having to move to the sleeper sofa. That's when Jesus told me he was actually at the convenience store out by the interstate. I must have gotten that Bambi in the headlights look because my wife hissed, what is it? What's wrong? Who is that? So I covered the receiver and told her Jesus was going to arrive in eight minutes. She ran out of the room and started giving guidance to the kids in that effective way that marine drill instructors give guidance to recruits. My mind was already racing with what needed to be done in the next eight, no, seven minutes so Jesus wouldn't think we were reprobate loser slobs. I turned off the TV in the din, which was blurring some weird, scary movie I'd been half watching, but I could still hear screams from our bedroom. So I turned off the reality show that it was turned to, plus I turned off the kids' set out on the sun porch because I didn't want to have to explain John and Kate plus eight to Jesus either <laughs> six minutes from now. My wife had already thinned out the magazines that had been accumulating on the coffee table. She put Christianity Today on top for a good first impression, five minutes to go. I looked out the front window, but the yard actually looked great thanks to my long, hard work, so I let it go. What could I improve in four minutes anyway? I did notice the mail had come, so I ran out to grab it. Mostly it was Netflix envelopes and a bunch of catalogs tied into recent purchases, so I stuffed it back in the mailbox. Jesus doesn't need to get the wrong idea three minutes from now. And about how much online shopping we do. I ran back in and picked up a bunch of shoes left by the door, tried to stuff them in the front closet, but it was overflowing with heavy coats and work coats and snow coats and pretty coats and raincoats and extra coats. We live in the South. Why do we buy so many coats? I squeezed the shoes in with two minutes to go. I plumped up the sofa pillows. My wa wife tossed dishes into the sink. I scolded the kids. She shooed the dog. With one minute left, I realized something important. Getting ready for a visit from Jesus is not an eight-minute job. Then the doorbell rang. <laughs> it's not an eight-minute job. It's something we really do each and every day, isn't it? And uh, all of this is really, really going to happen. It's like the train coming down the track. You cannot believe the sun's not going to come up tomorrow. It won't affect the sun at all. It's just going to do what it's going to do. Uh, everything that God has ever said prophetically has all come true 100% of the time. This is all going to come down just the way that God said it. Now, again, if we know God's grace, we've received his forgiveness, uh, we're part of that special group of people known as the church made up of Jews and Gentiles that are going to be raptured, caught up to be with the Lord, and, and, uh, and we should be really thankful. We should be really thankful for that. God has revealed himself to us, that we've come to know him. Uh, but I think the exhortation for us is, uh, uh, are we ready, though, for his coming, ready to be with him? And it's not, a, it's not an eight-minute job, but it is something that we need to think about each and every day. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your love, your mercy. We, we agree with your word, that your judgments are just and true. We hate to think about them, but we know there is a reality. You could not be a good God and not judge evil. And Lord, we're, we're all evil. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. But by your grace, you've made a way for us to be forgiven. Lord, when we think about how horrific this is, we need to think about how horrific it was for you to be beaten, nailed to a Roman cross. Lord, that's the, the balance in, in all of this. You would not have done that, Lord, if you did know, not know what was coming in the future. Lord, so may we, we think about uh, what you've done for us, how you've provided for us, how you've given us robes of righteousness, and that you will come quickly for us one day. Lord, so may we 
May we prepare each day to be with you. May we live each day uh, knowing that one day we'll be with you forever. Help us set, set our frame of mind, our attitudes, our dreams, our priorities, Lord, that they might be lived for you. Because the prayer that we have been praying, all Christians have been praying for 2,000 years, is going to come true. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. And this is when it happens. It happens at the campaign of Armageddon when you return. That's when your will is going to get done here on earth as it is in heaven. But then to set up your glorious millennial kingdom that we will be part of, Lord. So, Lord, help us be future-looking, Lord, to live with you. Have that eternal perspective in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can fathom other riches.